we drink tequila, we talk. Welcome to Team Tequila Talks. Talk, talk, talk. Ready! Okay, here we go. Did I sound a little bit like a cheerleader just then? I think so. Yeah, you did. Ready! Yeah, well, um, is your glass full? Are you already made? Look at this glass that I found at the hotel. Oh, very it's like, fancy. It's like a cross between a wine goblet and I think a margarita glass. Like, I don't know. Yeah. It just looked, It just looked cool. And I haven't drank out of one of these before, or at least not in this circumstance. So I thought it was a good idea. Also, like it. on the bar, this guy, um, I don't know what it is. I'm assuming it's like, Perfume. No, it's not perfume. It's on the bar. It's. I think it's like an aromatic, like an herbal thing. <laughs> um, I'm spraying it. I don't know. I'm gonna put some in. Hopefully, it's not actually perfume. You know, hopefully it goes well. I think. No, I it's think it's like, like a. Spritz. It's like a cocktail thing. I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Well, cheers. Cassandra cheers Gina Mel here, still calling in from across the pond, and Terrian Gonzalez, welcoming you to Team Tequila Talks. Hello. Well, that's good. Yeah, I, I, I support the funky bitters. So we have a really interesting guest that I think you and I specifically are really excited to talk to because we are uh, health enthusiasts and yes. nutrition enthusiasts. And so to, in honor of that today, we are actually keeping it really simple. We decided to go the tequila soda route after consulting with our guests, Tony Bloom from Bloom Training. And we're going to get into why we drink what we drink and is there better ways to drink uh, in terms of your metabolic health. But this is just a tequila soda. And I added some, a squeeze of lime and orange. Um, and these, this fancy little bitters aromatic, it's not bitters, it's like aromatic Sprite. I don't know. It's good. Um, it's but fancy. basically it is a very fancy tequila soda because I'm at a hotel. So I feel like I should, you know, elevate my, my game, even if it's a simple cocktail. Yes. Well, I'm at home and, uh, I am doing tequila soda. Well, tequila Waterloo. I did the orange Waterloo. Yeah. Sparkling yep. water, zero sugar, no calories. Yep. yep. So With you have an in, you have a hint of citrus essence in there as well. Yes. Okay. Yep. Great. We are drinking our tequila sodas because I would say arguably, you probably ask any nutritionist and they're gonna say, if you're gonna drink, drink this. And it would be a clean quality liquor with soda and maybe a squeeze of lemon or lime, possibly an orange slice, just to kind of have that hint of citrusy aftertone, undertone, et cetera. And that's because this is going to be no sugar, low calorie. You don't have extra chemicals and junk in the cocktail that you're getting. And it's so refreshing. And the, and like the bubbles are kind of nice, especially if it's hot outside summer right now, we want to work with the refreshing motif, right. not the, nice. you know, the hot toddy of it all. <laughs> no, nice and cold, nice and cold. I think, what is it? What is it? I think a shot of two shots of tequila is about 60 calories. So if you're following, about 80, but 80, 80, yeah, I did, 80. and again, making sure that we are talking about hundred percent blue Weber agave tequila here and none yes. of that mixed so cut with sugar. No, water no, no, stuff. no, no, no. And it's zero carbs. And I think when you're Talking about like losing weight or even maintaining weight. I don't, I don't, I mean, I'm always five pounds away from my goal weight. I always joke like, and I think every woman, a lot is, of people. <laughs> it's, I, I feel like a lot of women are always like, oh, I can lose five pounds. I can lose five pounds. It's like the forever forbidden five pounds. But I think for me, most part, I maintain my weight. I, you know, when I, I go to a bar and I'm going like some fancy mixology place you were at last week, I mean, obviously I'm going to taste the drinks. I'm not going to say, oh, sure. low sugar. Yeah. I'm not going to tell a bar to no, how to make it. Cause you're there for but, the experience, not for your diet. Right. But if I'm doing my normal average everyday life drinking, I'm pretty much looking for super low calorie, but living my life. Yep. Yeah. Did you use a silver or a uh, mezcal or reposado? I used a mezcal. You used a mezcal. Okay. Yeah. I used a reposado actually, because Ooh. We usually go the route of if you're drinking reposado, you're sipping, if you're mixing, it's a silver, but this is kind of a gray area because you're not really mixing it with any flavors. Technically, you're sort of diluting it with club soda right. um, and adding some texture with the bubbles, but you're not adding, I just use straight old fashioned regular soda water. Like it's not infused with anything. And then I did add that squeeze of lime and orange, but that's why I kind of thought that the reposado might be nice because 
you know, it is pretty straight forward and like you're not really miss messing with the flavor much right nice and bold nice and bold yeah yeah but it's got some taste to it hi yes. tony hello tony hello what's hello. up what's how you up doing? how so you doing this uh this is sherry on gonzalez over here or well what's she's up, sherry? sherry on gonzalez <laughs> and i'm Guzan, <laughs> and, Mel, and we are really lucky to have a metabolic expert from bloom training mm-hmm. tony bloom and if you haven't checked out his instagram that page alone is worth your time of uh, just clearing up a lot of metabolic myths and really getting into you know um a little bit of supplementation a little bit of methodology and i just found your page really really interesting lots of knowledge thank you thank you very much i tried to yeah. <laughs> yeah we're like we're like frustrated nutritionists over here like we don't have degrees but basically we love nutrition anything that has to do with what you put in your body output input I mean we're obsessed we love working out and I think a lot of people don't realize that what works for you may not work for someone else but there is no really big like cookie cutter you know Hershey bar line of like no. fitness type of thing yeah Another interesting thing that, because I did technically my full degree is not in nutrition, but I did study nutrition. So I don't have, and I love, I don't have the full fledged registered dietitian status, but I do like to read up. I do like to continue my education. I read all the long, boring, sciencey papers. Um, And one of the things that I've been reading a lot lately is about how men and women hormonally, your body's going to do different things with when you eat, how much you eat. Uh, And one of the things that I saw that uh, on your page that I know that has been dispelled is we used to think, you know, 20 years ago that in order for your metabolism to fire on all cylinders, you just had to constantly be eating, right? Like you were just eating six to eight small meals per day and it had to be like, tuna you know like all the protein I remember that was a trick that they taught me back in my pageant days they were like you got to sneak into the bathroom at school and and down a chicken breast to keep that metabolism firing and you know now we have more science that explains why that's not necessarily true hit us with some knowledge Tony yeah well okay that was actually funny that you brought that up because that is still I mean it's still it's old school thought but it's still well believed okay I was like just making sure we are drinking right we have a yes <laughs> welcome right here. Yeah. cheers okay I was oh, like I have... wish we could have a more fun cocktail but this is probably this probably fits the episode a little bit more that's what yeah. we're going for mm-hmm. perfect yeah so uh, it's interesting that you bring that up I think I even pulled up a few slides too because hormonally just how different men and women are something interesting as well that I've been digging into especially when it comes to uh drinking is how differently alcohol at moderate and heavy levels affect men and women differently because I think a lot of people think that okay you know drinking is just it's a nice blanket to say oh drinking decreases testosterone it does xyz when it completely affects men and women differently and sometimes opposite and at different amounts of alcohol too which I think is super super interesting but yeah we were talking about I think you were mentioning TEF or like the thermic effect of food and it still is kind of thought of you know the more small meals you have through the day, the more it burns your, you know, spikes your metabolic flame or whatever it might be, which has been completely dispelled when (laughs) the thermic effect really comes down more to total intake, not how frequent your meals are. So if you have two 1200 calorie meals spread through the day versus six, 400 calorie meals, I think that math is right. You're going to get the same amount of burn (laughs) from it. Uh, But what I think is more interesting is where the food source is coming from. In, this, in the terms of like macronutrients, right? Protein versus carbs versus fat. Funny enough, alcohol is technically considered like the fourth macronutrient, but they all have different uh, thermic effects. Protein being the highest, burning about 25 to 30% of the calories eaten from protein just in the digestion process alone, where something like fat only has like three to 5% of a thermic effect, meaning you only burn three to five calories for every 100 calories of fat you consume. So it is kind of interesting where you kind of look at like where you're consuming your calories from matters a lot more than when you're eating them, if that makes sense. Yeah, sure does. yeah, that, that totally makes sense. So it's basically like, for me growing up, I was always like an athletic, I was a dancer. And now that I've gotten a little bit older, I'm not that much, I'm just a little tiny bit older than I was when I was younger. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes that how my body processes even a whole carb, like a sweet potato now than what it would do back then. If I have a, when I was dancing, I would do a chicken breast, 
and a sweet potato and like a bunch of spinach back when they were like, you know, spinach and garlic. And I would shrink in like five days. If I ate that now, like if I ate that now, it's not the same at all. If my husband does it, he sh- he looks shredded. <laughs> <laughs> it's it really does come down to especially as you age like how active you tend to be and this is actually interesting uh i was even reading this massive publication done by duke i think it came out last year in 2020 i think is when it actually came out looking at like metabolism as we age because i think that's just again like one of those common things that everyone hears right is your metabolism just slows down as you get older but what this study actually did was it separated age from lean body mass and your muscle tissue in general, and it actually showed up to 60 years old, your metabolism doesn't slow down relative to your lean body mass. Meaning as you age, if you can keep your same or relatively same lean body mass as you age, your metabolic rate is going to stay the same. So what it typically, I think people see is they're less active as they age, right? They're not engaged in sports, which, I mean, when you were doing that, you were probably active every single day for multiple hours a day. Oh yeah. And then we don't do the things like a high protein diet or resistance training nearly as much to hold on to lean body mass. So that's where we notice like, dang, I can't eat like I used to and maintain figure or maintain health like I used to, which is frustrating as heck. I know, I know for sure. Well, I remember being super duper skinny when I was young and it's just that like, my hor- I was a late bloomer. My my hormones hadn't kicked in, like my curves didn't come in, whatever, for a little while. And, and I remember, people in the generation above me always saying, just you wait, you know, just you wait. It's when you get older, that metabolism is going to slow down. But then I think you look at the people that are saying that because you see people that are in their thirties, forties, fifties, and they're in excellent shape and they're, they're yeah. eating and they're not starving themselves. And I, I think you're right. It's because they're active because the people that are saying, Oh, your metabolism is going to slow down are the people who have not really prioritized their body composition, their fitness routine, their active lifestyle. And listen, it's hard. Life gets in the way. Like you have kids, oh, yeah. you, job, you get, you know, yeah. like, and, and even if you're not in a relationship, you are, it's just really hard to find the hours in the day. And not a lot of yeah. people can do that to the same degree that they could when they were at, in collegiate athletics. Yeah. hundred percent. So true. Yeah. And hormonally, like, I think as you, like, for me, I'm pretty much the same size I was in college. Like I still wear the same jeans. That's not the problem. The problem is the proportions. I'm more, I'm more um, softer because I think my muscle tone, um, and I know lifting, what do you think about women lifting? I know a lot of women have this issue where they're always like, I don't want to lift because I don't want to get bulky, oh, bulk, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Bulk. But I know that when I, look at photos from three years ago when I was lifting at least three to four days a week. And I'm talking about, I would do one day, just heavy lifting, yeah. not a lot of, um, um, aerobic activity, like no hit. There was no sprints in between no burpees. And I'm like, you know what I was, you know, my arms were definitely like bigger, but mm. I was a little tinier. Yeah, no, I'm and a I'm- huge component of girls lifting heavy weights, like massive, just because I think that we actually were talking about this on our podcast uh, yesterday is when we were bringing this up because a lot of women are afraid of lifting heavier weights with that fear of like getting big and getting bulky. And there's a few reasons why it's, it's kind of like an illegitimate fear, but it does make sense when you look at it, right? Like if, if you're a female and you're looking at the weight section of a gym, you typically see big joked dudes just sitting over there. And then you see like the cardio sessions, like section, and you see people who are typically thinner. And you're like, okay, well, I'm going to correlate like and do what they're doing because I want to look like that. And it kind of comes down to, I don't know if you've ever heard of the swimmer's body illusion, right? Where it's like, you know, you're like, I want to work out. I want to get fit. I don't want to lift weights. I don't want to look like them. They're bulky. I don't want to do cardio and look thin like them. I want to look like a swimmer. So they start swimming and they start to realize after a few months, like, oh, swimmers don't look the way they do because they swim. They swim because the way they look, right? They have broader shoulders. They have that like longer muscle that really helps them in that sport. Same thing. I think when it comes to lifting weights, it's like most women have more specific goals. Like I want to look leaner, more defined. If you want to look bigger and more muscular, that's freaking awesome. But it's a lot more challenging from a female's perspective, just because the biggest thing that really determines if you can put on muscle just as a human being from like a physiological and biological standard is your, the size of your frame. And females just typically have a lot smaller of a frame than men do. So they just can't typically hold as much muscle tissue, right? Along with not having 
the hormones like testosterone just raging through, it's a lot harder for females. Like it's, you're not going to accidentally pick up a weight and gain 30 pounds of muscle, right? It's just not usually how it works. And it usually is the best thing you can do to hold on to lean body mass as you lose weight, which is more controlled through like your diet than it is through exercise. That's typically what gives you that leaner, more defined look that you're going for is like holding on to heavier weight training, well, which I, is I always kind of funny. Interesting mm -hmm. that you mentioned diet, because I know that when I go through, I'm pretty, I'm pretty cyclical with my workouts. For example, I'm traveling right now and I'm not really setting foot in a gym. I'm much more in the like, let's yoga, let's spend time outside, mm. let's play some tennis. You know, that that is much more my speed. And as long as I'm staying active, I'm cool with that. And then there's probably going to be some point where I get back home and I go, oh, I'm really itching to hit the gym. And now I want to go in and put in that time with the weights. And that's a lot of that is my lifestyle because I travel a lot and I'm lots of different places. And so that's what works for me. But I do yeah. notice that when I go to the gym and I am lifting more weights more frequently or I'm home for a good stretch and I'm in, in the gym several times a week, I get so much hungrier. And I yeah. think that that's the thing is all of a sudden you're still like, why am I ravenous? Why am I starving? And a lot of times that can lead to overeating. And in your mind, you're like, well, you know, I'm working out really hard. So this doesn't really count. It offsets. But really, if you're adding like an extra 1200 calories a day to your diet and also going to lift, you're just going to bulk up more. That's just kind of math, right? That's just how, that's just how the science of it works. Yeah. I mean, just from like, a, yeah, just from like that standpoint, it's more if you're in a calorie surplus, right? If you're eating a lot more than you're burning, that's how you end up gaining weight. If you're in a caloric deficit, that's how you end up losing weight. So if your goal is to get leaner, more defined, you would want to lift weights, but maintain that caloric deficit. But just with how much lean body mass and muscle is like the real like engine of our metabolic rate, right? It does make you hungry. It does kind of increase uh, hormones like leptin and ghrelin, your hunger hormones. Uh, but it's just that metabolic engine to where it's like, if you can control your nutrition, that's where that leanness, that definition really comes from. But there's that like secondary effect of, yeah, it's going to make you a lot hungrier just because you're burning through so much more holding on to lean body mass, recovering from those heavyweight sessions where most cardio sessions or yoga or hit doesn't really take that long to recover from. So it usually doesn't initiate that much hunger. Right. Mm. So I have a question for you because here at Team Tequila Talks, we're big on if you're going to drink, drink smarter. We love hitting the oh, yeah. gym and then having a cocktail after and, you know, having a great dinner and, and enjoying or evening living your life right and i heard uh detox and retox yeah, that's what oh, yeah. <laughs> your show. Oh, we I detox love it. to retox I love yeah it. we and love we, it so we also have done cocktails that we we really focus on replenishing electrolytes keeping it low in sugar not wanting to spike the gi index too much but if you've just worked out that kind of is the time that you might be able to handle a little bit more glucose so you know we have sort of thought and discussed about what the best things to drink after a workout are. And we've certainly had on some experts about electrolytes and, and sort of anti-inflammatory and recovery, mm -hmm. but I'm curious from a nutrition standpoint, what the best strategy is like, do you eat something while you're having a cocktail? Do you yeah. eat something after? Do you want to, is it okay to have a little bit of sugar in your cocktail after you've worked out because you know, you're, you can handle the glucose load differently, or should you be keeping it super clean? Like what's, if you, what, what's the best strategy here? Yeah. So I think this, and we could even dive down a little bit of how your body processes alcohol to start with and then this yeah. will make a lot more sense because i think what i would actually recommend is probably almost more backwards than what most people would initially think but when you drink alcohol right when we're having a drink right now it enters your body the calories you're getting from alcohol right because calories can only come from four places carbs proteins fats and alcohol and the mm -hmm. calories from alcohol come from something called ethanol and your body sees ethanol as toxic right so what it pretty much does in that moment is because we're always burning calories, just keeping ourselves alive, is it temporarily blunts the fat that you're burning for fuel to get rid of the ethanol in your bloodstream, right? It wants to get rid of that. And your body's really good at detoxing itself. That's why I'm not a big fan of like the whole detox supplements and things like that. It's like your body does a really good job on its own through that, right? So it starts to get rid of the toxins of alcohol, which can take anywhere from like two to 25 hours, depending on how much you have to where while that's in your body, you're going to be really suppressing how much fat you're burning, which 
in turn increases the amount of fat from your diet you're actually storing as body fat, right? So oh. when you're looking at it from a perspective of when you're going out, right? Let's say like your goal, it really is goal dependent, but let's say your goal is just to get leaner, hold on to muscle and not store any extra body fat when you're drinking, right? From a nutritional standpoint. Sure. So somewhere closer to the maintenance part Lane. of the spectrum, yeah. meaning like yeah. maintenance to like, share. you always mentioned that wanting to lose that last five pounds. Yeah. So we're not trying <laughs> to do anything extreme here. We're not yeah. training to like drop 20 pounds and we're no. not trying to bulk up and gain muscle. We're also not on the like, I don't care end of the spectrum. Yeah. We're somewhere right. in the maintenance to maybe want to tone few up a little. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to, if you want to maintenance or lose that final few pounds of body fat, right, you'd want to keep your, and I mean, calories are important. They're not the only thing that matters, but they do matter in this sense, right? If you're trying to maintain your intake and your output really have to be pretty much matched, right? So the goal when it comes to alcohol and the, the crappy part about it is it does have what people call like those empty calories, right? The stuff coming from ethanol, where if you're having a lot of drinks, it can really sneak up on you, right? I think a one ounce pour is anywhere from like, if we're having like a vodka soda, 60 to 70 calories. But if you're doing like a two ounce pour, this is what actually screwed me up because I was actually a bartender. My best friend, Kirsty gave me a job as a bartender as I started Bloom Training years ago to make the income to support. I didn't realize the difference in alcoholic pours that people give at bars. I had no clue. I thought when you ordered a drink, you just got the drink. <laughs> <But> <laughs> <Right>. The difference <laughs> between like a one ounce pour and a two ounce pour can be 60, 70 to 120 to 140 calories at that. So so the goal while maintaining yourself would be to essentially limit the calories that you're getting from alcohol while still getting the desired effect. So it really depends on like, okay, what are you really drinking for? Is it to feel a little tipsy to use as like social lubricant just to have a little bit more fun, right? Usually you drink to feel the effects of alcohol. So typically what you actually want to do is get the largest feeling out of the least amount of alcohol as you could. So when you're eating while you drink, you typically slow down the absorption, right? Like, you know, if you have a big meal right before you go drink, you can have three or four drinks, or I guess it's really different for everybody, but right. you can have a lot more drinks and not really feel it as much as if you go on, you know, if you're on an empty stomach or even worse, like after a workout, yeah. when your, your hydration's yeah. down, you feel that first sip of alcohol, it kind of smacks you in the face, right? 100%. Kind of yeah. <laughs> so ultimately, from a sobriety standpoint, you'd want to eat some heavier carb, heavier fat meals to slow down the absorption. But from a body composition standpoint, it would almost make more sense to go into it not eating for a few hours before. So you get the same feeling out of maybe one or two drinks, than you would three or four or five, because net, you're gonna be taking in hundreds of less calories, which is going to keep right. your body composition where it needs to be. Does that kind of answer yeah, the question? Yeah. No, that that totally makes sense. Because like you get, you get into your goal of drinking, right? Like there are some nights if I'm having a girl's night and I'm like, look, I have school in the morning, drop off my kid. I'm not about to have five margaritas and, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, I'm just, so it's like, okay, I'll have, I'll start with just like a tequila on the rocks just to kind of like get the day off me. And then I maybe have two glasses of wine and then go home. But I think it's interesting that you're like, then maybe you don't have a meal because normally I'm like, oh, I need to put something in my stomach first before I go, yeah. go on this. That's, yeah. that's the saying, intuitive part of it. If you yeah. want to say, if I'm going to be drinking, I'm going to at least have a little something, you know, you go like all of these, most bars have a either a happy hour menu or a bar bites menu. Right. Um, yeah. and, and just yeah. because they know that if you're going to be drinking, most people want to be eating at least a little something at the same time. Right. Yeah. And what would you say, what foods to avoid when you're drinking alcohol so not yeah. even just post-workout in general in general yeah. yeah so this is something i think people once you really dissect like how your body metabolizes alcohol and what your metabolism is doing while alcohol is present you don't start to kind of realize so whenever i have clients because i'm a big lifestyle first kind of person right like if you're trying to make even massive change in your physique like it's going to take a lot of time for you being consistent so if you start shutting out things like your social life drinking, if you like to do that, it's just ultimately not going to work out long term. So when you look at it, if you still want to include drinking while making progress, if it is even leaning out those final few pounds, when you blunt fat burning, right, or fat oxidation, when alcohol is present, and you increase how much fat is being stored, we got to realize like the fat being stored is coming from dietary fat, 
right? Your body doesn't have a very good mechanism at storing or really converting carbs or glycogen into body fat. And same thing with protein. So you're storing that extra dietary fat when you're drinking. So it would make more sense to stay away from, and this is what sucks because usually at bars, it's usually the like fattier food, nachos, wings, things like that. It's typically you want to stay out of your foods more to the leaner proteins, the carbohydrates, because that's not going to be as easily stored as body fat. So typically if I have clients going out to drink, I say, okay, make sure if you're eating fat, you get it earlier in the day, high protein, high carbs, and save those extra calories that you will be drinking from the fat sources. So you don't end up storing it because that extra body yeah. fat is usually what gets stored. So we want to go low fat. If we are going to be like, if you're after that workout and you're like, I got to have something, I need to eat something or I'm just not going to feel great because you know, I'm like a pot. And if I'm going to have a drink, I need yeah. to eat something. Then you really want to look more towards those like chicken skewers as opposed yeah. to the chips and salsa or sorry, I, I guess as opposed to something that's like fried and fatty because well, chips and fatty, are yeah. fried, but yeah. yeah. Okay. That's I mean, I definitely, yeah. And I definitely feel the difference. If I eat me and Cassandra, we do this. We'll eat really clean. We'll go to her house mm -hmm. for dinner. We'll eat really clean and have drinks and you wake up the next meal. Fine. Yeah. yeah. And I find that if this now goes into my next question about the hangover and the binge eating that happens. Mm -hmm. So like, so as I've gotten a little bit older, you know, if I have a heavy night of drinking, I tend to pop a smoothie in my mouth first thing in the morning. I don't go or an egg. I have this thing about eggs right after I have you a heavy love, night. Of you love you love a hangover egg. And I never I, want eggs. And this is an I do because we talked I'm, a, I'm a on your bit. team. <laughs> well, you know, and we, we looked this up and there's apparently a chemical or not a chemical, like a compound or a, like a substance in the egg that actually does kind of negate a, a hangover, at least to an extent. I just never want eggs if I'm feeling a little, mm -hmm. I, I mean, and I, my hangovers are few and far between because I generally don't over consume these days because I've learned what my limits are over the years. And I also like, you know, we've, we work really hard to drink smarter and we drink quality products and we make sure yeah. that we're getting, you know, our, our sodium and potassium and all of these things yeah. back into us. We're working in electrolytes, drinking water after yep. a, a drink. So yeah. my, my hangovers are few and far between, but it, on the rare occasion that it happens, I never want an egg. Bacon, sure. <laughs> so maybe like maybe I am craving more fats. So what like what is the, you know what what's the formula for drink or eating after you had a big night out? Yeah. So I'm kind of I'm honestly I, I don't know why, but like a bacon egg and cheese sandwich to me when I'm hungover is like the greatest thing in the world. Like a salty sandwich is just it's phenomenal. But if you want to still play, because especially if you're hungover, it's probably because you were drinking not just one or two drinks, but you probably had several drinks in most cases. And it's still going to, I mean, the, the alcohol half-life, I think is anywhere from two to five hours is the half-life of how like your body processes alcohol. Body composition standpoint, it would make more sense to still avoid like the dietary fats, like the high, like the fatty eggs, the bacon, things like that. And it would make more sense for a smoothie. To ultimately feel good. And I think too, even part of the hangover, and they can come from different places, but part of the hangover is also because your brain typically uses carbohydrates or glycogen as fuel. And I don't think people realize this. Actually, my uh, co-coach that I work with, Mariana, who does my podcast as well, she has her master's in molecular nutrition. She's a freaking genius. Cool. Um, but I, cool. oh, I know. I love picking at her, her questions, <laughs> but a large part of it is when your body suppresses fat burning when alcohol is in your body because it needs to use alcohol. It also suppresses stored glycogen. So your brain is not getting as much glycogen as it needs to typically run. So the next day, your brain's been running for hours and hours off of fuel that it does not prefer. So typically getting carbs that next morning as well can kind of help your brain if that hits you more than nausea. I know it's different for everybody. Can usually help a little bit, but from the composition standpoint, it is hard because you typically have cravings and that comes with alcohol too, is usually like lowered inhibitions. You typically just want those, <laughs> those fatty or the salty, so those more processed foods, but it would typically make a little more sense to stay more towards like a fruit smoothie or something like that, where it's more carb, 
nutrient dense. And foods. the fruits that you're getting or the carbohydrates that you're getting from the fruits are going to be natural. So they're a super bioavailable. Right. It's different than waking up in the morning and just grabbing a bag of potato chips. Right. So mm-hmm. it's very straightforward. It's very clean. It's nature's candy. I mean, I never really want sweet in the morning ever, regardless of mm-hmm. yeah, no. what my situation, like regardless of what my drinking situation is. I, if I, I do get a sweet too sometimes, but it's always in the evening for me. It's never mm. in the morning. I never, I, when I, we go to brunch and I see people that have those gimmicky pancakes with like the, the Nutella. That's a little too all much. All of that stuff. Yeah. I'm just like, yeah. no, that sounds awful to me. That's like, that's not anywhere near what I would want to put in my body first thing in the morning under any circumstances. Even if I yeah. am kind of feeling it, I, I want salty. I don't want fruitier or sweet. At right. All. What about, so like, I do this sometimes where if I have a big drinking day, I'll wake up the next day and have a big workout and sweat it out. Is that, I know a lot of people think, including myself, that there is a component of sweating it out or going to a big steam room and getting a nice sweat and just revving up that heart heart rate, turning over some cells. I don't know. I just feel like if I have a hangover, moving is just going to flush it out. totally works. Yeah. You know, when you just rip off the Band-Aid and get to the gym the next morning, I always feel like, fine after it's it is it's so hard to get there when you're hungover but it actually so about like i think it's two to ten percent of the alcohol is removed through sweat and when you pee the other 90 percent is usually handled handled by your liver right so up to ten percent but i think usually what people also forget is you're burning it as energy to get out of the body so if you're in the gym you're using a lot more energy in the moment right you're lifting weights you're running you're burning a lot more calories in the moment so you're helping your body get rid of that energy faster so it's typically why you'll feel a little bit better is yes you're sweating a little bit of it out which is always fun i remember i used to i mean this is probably like six seven years ago i coached these orange theory classes i moved to atlanta to open up some orange theory gyms and on saturday mornings we're like a younger group saturday mornings you could almost smell the alcohol from yeah. the people sweating <laughs> out out the the night before. yeah it was too funny but yeah so going to the gym it, can, it is kind of like ripping off that bandaid because it you almost don't want to do anything less than go be active when you have like a pounding headache (laughs) but with sweating and just moving you really are helping your body kick it out well and that's an interesting thing too i mean this is almost piggybacking off of what we were talking about a second ago i remember this trainer explaining to me and this was a while ago sort of about the thermal effect of alcohol and you were speaking earlier about how it turns into ethanol and your body goes ding 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 toxin and instead of sending it to the stomach your pancreas kicks in and redirects it to the liver so if you're just drinking like we said liquor and soda a lot of times your body is burning those calories as long as you're not drinking like a 700 calorie pina colada where you've got all mm-hmm. this added extra junk with sugars yeah. and everything and fats but if you're just drinking something like a tequila soda, your body is going to kick it over to the detox and not really necessarily absorb all those calories. However, if you have six of those drinks and then you get home and eat an entire box of cereal or order a late night pizza, and now you're messing with your cycles, which is going to disrupt your leptin. It's going to disrupt your hormones because you ate at 2 a.m. when you normally like finish up eating for the day at maybe 8.30 p.m. Mm-hmm. And that is where people say, oh, I lose weight when I stop drinking. That might be part of it, but it's also about the behavior of what you're eating while you're drinking with those lower inhibitions and all of a sudden switching to bar food because you're like, screw it because you're three margaritas in. Right. Exactly. Yeah. There's always, I think it's always, because you got to look at everything, not just from like a first order consequence, but like, what are the second and the third order consequence? Because yeah, first order, it's like, oh, well, you're only drinking 200 calories. It's not that bad. But second order is, yeah, it lowers your inhibitions. It lowers your sleep quality. It makes you consume a lot more of these. Exactly. All these things that are causing you to sleep worse, which is just, I mean, sleep is one of the most underrated things you can do for your overall health, but lowers your inhibition, increases your appetite causes you to consume a lot more food. It's those like second and third order consequences that, yeah, it's like when people say I cut out liquor, it helped me lose weight. It's like, was it the liquor or was it everything that came with it? Right. And that's usually what it is. So here's my, I have a question about that. So Mm. if I'm, I'm not one of those people that needs to do like, I need to a month off drinking. I just don't drink that much to where I need to like really, really, 
But I do notice that if during the week, if I'm not being social, I don't drink. If I'm at home with my husband and my daughter and we're just mm-hmm. watching, I don't, I don't need a glass of wine or anything in my hand. But I notice that I'm hungrier. And then when I do have a drink in my hand, I and after I eat dinner, I'm not snacky Kathy. Like I don't need, you know, any, I just have my cocktail. I can watch a movie and be fine. But when I'm not drinking, I feel like I eat more sometimes when I'm not drinking. You're, you're more you... peckish when you're not drinking, you're saying. Yeah. And you're thinking like, may, may, is your thought process, I normally have 2,200 calories a day. And if I'm not having those three glasses of wine, maybe my body is hungry to make up for that deficit. Is maybe. that your I, thought process? I don't know. It, it, it's not even a thought. It's like, I just feel hungrier. You're just like, and, I and am it, now hungry. I'm like, I, like I'll eat a, a massive dinner like a good healthy dinner and then I'll be like oh there's some chocolate and I'll have my I have I chocolate 100% every night will go for the chocolate if I, I have, chocolate don't every night. have a glass of wine or something like that I, yes. I, I see what you're saying I for, and yes. that's where my sweet tooth kicks in that's when I want something that's like a cookie or a chocolate or whatever and you know we've talked about actually last episode we talked about getting really high quality clean chocolate yeah um, and there's so many great options out there now, whereas yeah. before it was just like, oh, I guess I have to eat this Hershey's bar. And yeah. so there's a, you can get a lot of good stuff that is not going to mess with your regular eating pattern. But that's, right. it's interesting that you say that because now that I'm thinking about it, that's yeah, I just get hungrier. Well, it's interesting. And there's a big difference between like how satiating a food group or like how much it satisfies a craving of yours versus how much total food or food volume there might be. Because mm-hmm. I know a big like obsession in the diet kind of culture is to eat like volume foods, right? Like veggies, things that are very voluminous, but contain low calories. It's like, you could eat this much food, but if you're not eating something that satisfies you, your body's still gonna be like, I'm hungry. I need to, pe- I need this. I need a little chocolate. I need something to satisfy it. So what that alcohol that you're choosing might be doing is like satisfying and kind of turning that switch off for you when you don't have it still needs to be flipped. Or it could just be maybe like if you're drinking, it's more of a social setting. So you're also more distracted versus if you're at home, you might just be kind of chilling, watching the TV. You know, it, it could be a different lot, lot of factors, but I think satiety is a huge piece. Well, kind mm. of on that note, I have a question because being on vacation right now, your habits are inevitably going to change when you are on vacation, both yeah. with your food consumption and your alcohol consumption. I am a total foodie. And I am super clean with what I bring into the house because I know that if I go to a two Michelin star restaurant with a seven course prefix menu, I'm getting that menu and the damn wine because oh, yeah. I want to experience all of it. I, you've got to live a little, you could experience things. And I think that that's, you know, that, that experience of a prefix or something special or something local that is what all the hard work is for. So that when you're at home and you're eating really clean and you're hitting the gym, you know that you can go experience life and not feel sluggish or lethargic or, or feel like you can't catch up with your vacation. That kind of sometimes is true with drinks on vacation. Cause you'll go to, we went to this amazing bar in London and they had all of these really interesting vintage cocktails and custom concoctions. And it was, Mm. it was an experience. And I drank some things that I wouldn't normally drink because that's what you're there to do is experience. So sometimes you end up drinking more on vacation. Oh yeah. And that's what vacation is for. Yeah, yeah, it is. And Sherry, I feel like your question, like when we were talking about this was more like, do you, drink slow and steady or do you say I'm only going to drink at night or you know I think this comes a little bit back to what you were saying Tony about what's the desired effect right Right. and in this case it's maybe not to get tipsy but it's maybe to experience a cool local oh yeah or to go to a very unique dinner so what are like how would vacation guidelines be a little bit different yeah. And I think it, it depends. I think you have to ask yourself when you're going on vacation, like ultimately, like what is, what's the goal that you're working for? Cause I'm on the same page as you, where I've set my life up for like, I really value connections and social events with my friends. And if I'm traveling or experiencing like a very cool bar with like a great bartender, it's like, I want to see what cool cocktails that, you know, I want to taste what they can do. It isn't all about getting tipsy. So it's kind of addressing like where your goals are. For example, like if I have a client who has a wedding in four months and she wants to look the absolute best she can, but she's got two vacations in between. She might want to take the approach where 
yeah, she's going to have some drinks, but we might want to set up the dates where it's like, okay, maybe we'll go to like an intermittent fasting schedule where it's like, you know, you're only eating more protein, carbs, limiting fats. So when you are drinking, we're not going to store any extra body fat. I like for most people, because most people, their goals aren't like deadlines, or I don't like when most people's goals are like, I need to look like this by this date, because you t- that's typically not how progress works, right? It takes right, time. Right. So I like it more set up because if you realize if you go on vacation for a week, like you're not going to get out of shape in a week, just like you can't get in shape in a week, no matter how good or bad you behave, right? If you have five drinks versus two drinks a night in the grand, in two months from now, it's not going to matter at all. So I'm a bigger fan of if you're on vacation, go for it. I think it also comes into play because I've also had clients who are on vacation every other week where they go out of town for a week. And that's when it can be like a really struggle to make progress is if you're constantly going out, you're constantly giving in. It's like, okay, maybe set up some boundaries, but it all depends on how aggressive you want to be with your goals, how much you want to balance your lifestyle and kind of what you value, if that makes sense. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I feel like sometimes, you know, I was watching one of your videos and I think you said something like how long it takes your body to change when you get on a regimen. And I was shocked at how long you said, because I was like, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, well, it was, it was like, it was in the course of like weeks to months and even more than that. And I think most people see, I mean, it's terrible because I hate, this is why I got into the industry is like, it's, it's just a terrible industry where people are sold like 14 day diet plans or 30 day diet. Plan. It's like progress, meaningful progress that actually lasts takes months and sometimes even years, but people somehow like somehow fix that it's going to take two, three, four, five, six weeks to reverse the negative impact that the last five or 10 years of living have, you know, done to them. They'll eat off their, like, they'll not pay attention to their food. They won't work out for 10 years, which accumulates 30, 40 pounds of fat and expect it to be gone by the end of next month. It's like, that's not how change works. Right. That's not how you gained it. That's not how you're going to lose it. Right. So I think, and that's setting up realistic expectations, I think is absolutely huge in how well someone does with progress. Cause if you think that you're going to be somewhere in two weeks, you can motivate yourself to do so, but when you don't see what you expect, you're going to quit like right off the bat. Right. If you expect it to take longer in months, you'll start to really appreciate like, oh, I lifted five pounds more weight than I could have two weeks ago. You'll really appreciate that. Or if you start to see like a little more definition, you'll really appreciate that a lot more because you know that's what progress really looks like. Whereas if I think I'm going to be shredded in two weeks and I'm not, I'm going to be pissed <laughs> even if I really have made progress, you know? Well, and that's a, that's a lifestyle thing, right? Yeah. You know, you mm. got to work out, you got to incorporate even what I was saying about being on vacation and maybe I'm not in the gym, but I am doing a little flow. We're, we're walking yeah. more than we're driving. And, it, and that's like, that's a maintenance thing. And that's a lifestyle thing because I'm used to being physically active. And it's to the point where if I take more than a day or two where I am not active, I don't feel good. And yeah, it's not it, that I have to go and to lift too much. It, it catches up and I feel sluggish and lethargic. And like, I just, I, like, I don't, I feel like my energy levels dip. I don't feel great. I'm used to that yeah. physical outlet. Yeah, it yeah, doesn't like, mean, it's that all or nothing mentality of like, you know, I have to lift, I have to do this. Like I had a client who is, we're, honestly, our goal is to get her further away from lifting and eating so clean every single day because it's, it's almost an obsession where it's on the honeymoon it's, I need to work out five times on my, it's like, no, you don't like you're on a freaking honeymoon. Like, go spend yeah. time like You know, it's like, nothing bad is going to happen. You know what your workout should be? SEX. Exactly. Right. You're on a honeymoon, like focus on And this. that does burn calories. If you put your Apple watch oh, on yeah. open, on open goal, you'll be surprised. <laughs> yeah, you right, put so your Apple watch on open out. goal and you get frisky sherry on. I've done oh, it before. My God. <laughs> I've done I think it's before. a trend. I, I think curious. everyone should try it. I think I everyone mean, should try it. It gets some credit. You. Yeah, get some credit. Get some credit. I have close to close my close exercise <laughs> ring today. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know what's so interesting is that I I've like been reeling it in and trying to eat healthier. I've been I had a little action for the last few days, so no, I haven't been drinking. Um, but I was like, ooh, I've been taking my calories down a lot. I didn't really work out at first because I was like feeling lethargic. And I got on the scale and I weighed two pounds more. And I was like, what the fuck? Then <laughs> I, I lifted the other day for the first time in a, in a, in a long time. I'm gonna start lifting a little more. And then I got on the scale and it, then I was like a pound heavier. And I was like, I am eating 
clean and mean. And I'm like, how is the scale going up? So is it I, true? Well, yeah. I'm going to say, to piggyback onto that, I a lot of times will go on vacation and be like, I still look great. It doesn't even matter that I haven't been in the gym. But then I get home and about <laughs> yeah. two weeks later. I feel like mm-hmm. it's like it. you're, I mean, this, I don't think is a myth, but it takes your metabolism a couple weeks to catch up to what you're doing. True or false? The where you see it on the scale, where that comes from is because yeah. I mean, your body weight can fluctuate up to five to 10 pounds in a single day based on water weight alone. And there's a lot of different factors that go into how your body holds and stores water. And that's why like the scale can be a really useful tool if used right, but it also can like murder your motivation because you're like, I'm eating well, I'm working out, my, I gained weight. When it's like, you might not realize, you know, the timing of if you have a meal later in the day than usual, the day before, if you slept a little worse, if you weight train, your muscle is going to hold on to a little bit more water, which is good. It's what you want, but the scale usually jumps. So the first time someone jumps into a weight training routine, the first two to three weeks, they usually gain two or three pounds while they're losing body fat. So just because you're gaining weight doesn't mean you're not losing body fat because weight only measures, you know, how much gravity is pulling on the ground, not the composition, which I think most people agree, like who cares about the number on the scale if I look great, you know? So the fluctuations are a little terrible, but that's why if you're using the scale, be careful with it just because it's not going to tell you the truth 100% of the time. The whole truth. Right, so you shouldn't be judging when your scale is one- 34 versus 136 what you want to use that scale for is to make sure that all of a sudden you're not 149 and your pants don't fit yeah right. well and that's it's honestly it's like it's like any data right like the more data points you have the more clearly you can kind of see what's going on so people that weigh like once a month and they don't really have a consistent time it's like that's really not telling you that much because who knows if january 1st you weighed when your weight was way up here on a peak right? When you, you fluctuated high and then who knows if February 1st, you fluctuate low. It's like, oh, I lost seven pounds. When in reality, your body hasn't changed at all. It just was on a high and a dip or vice versa. You'll think you'll right. gain five pounds when it's like, no, your body's the same exact way. It just was on a dip and a, and a little rise. People that use the scale and it's frustrating because it, it's a hard relationship to have for some people. But if you want to get a good measure, measure yourself daily as soon as you wake up before you drink, before anything throws off the consistency of it. And after a week, you'll start to notice you have like a nice trending weight line. And that's where like, there's these cool apps. I think what's it called? I forget this. I think it's called happy scale, which syncs to your scale if you do it daily. And it gives you your trending weight, not your day to day. So your trending weight could be 182. Oh, and so it doesn't tell you, I've heard of this. They don't, it doesn't give you the actual number, right? It just tells you. It tells you you're trending. So it's like, yeah, so you could weigh in at 184 and then you look at happy scale and it's like, well, your weight's at 182 Mm -hmm. and it trends. So if you're trending down, it takes like the accumulation, I think the last 14 data points to really ultimately give you your point, which I freaking love because if you're really zoomed in on like the day to day, if you gain two pounds overnight, even though it's physically impossible to gain two pounds of body fat, right? that's what your head's going to think. Right. Yeah, and it right. turns with you in the other direction too. If you lose you, two pounds, you're like, hell yes, I just lost two pounds. <laughs> it's like, no, it's not, it's water. It's not it's yeah. water. Right. Well, yeah. I use, I use V-Sync. I have a V-Sync scale and it syncs to have, it's an app on my phone and it tells you how much water weight you have, how much muscle mass you have and like how much mm. fat, like, so I, I do like that. But I do notice that if I have a huge workout, I'll come home. Like th- I went to <sighs> boxing last week. I was three pounds lighter when I got home and I was like, fuck this. Cause you, this well, is- I mean, you like sweat. I know. Sweat yeah. out. I know. But then I'm like my five pounds. Right. So I'm always like my, and I'm like, Ooh, I'm two pounds away. But then like the next day, come you know, back yeah. I'm like, no, up, bitch. Yeah. 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 So I do think I, I agree. The scale isn't. And my, my brain has this really mega scale where it's like, it's your composition like, and all the things yeah, and it sends the waves yeah. up in your body and measures. I mean, that's yeah. cool, but that's not always accessible to everybody. Right. Yeah, and I find that yeah. the ones that are less expensive, like those, those don't, they're not really as accurate because you could measure your body fat percentage 24 hours apart and it jumps like a bunch, which actually isn't yeah. physically possible. Well, yeah. I actually don't even recommend the smart scales too, too much that are even pricier because it uses a technology. This is, I, people don't like when I say this, but like it, it uses those like little metal plates that you stand on. Yeah. Right. And it uses a technology called BIA or bioelectrical impedance, where it essentially sends electrodes up from one side to the other. And in theory, it makes a lot of sense where uh, electrodes travel different speeds through different body composition, right? Your muscle has a lot more water than fat and electricity travels a lot quicker 
through water, right? So it would conduct a lot quicker. So it measures the time back and forth. But the only problem is electricity typically chooses the path of least resistance. So it typically chooses muscle and avoids the fat. And then the calculations aren't super, super accurate. So I don't usually recommend those for progress because typically if you lose weight, it's going to tell you lost body fat. If you gain weight, it's going to tell you you gain body fat, even though it's probably right. coming from something else. Right. So it's uh, nice to you gotta do the old time, school but... pincher where they where they yeah. pinch your yeah. <laughs> oh damn. Okay. Well, we gotta wrap it up pretty soon. So let's let's give a good summary here. If you are going to be drinking, we want to limit the amount of dietary fat. And if you are drinking to get loose. Maybe have that first drink before you have a snack. If you are drinking for an experience, you know, eat when you want. But we want to limit our fats while we're drinking and also watch that timing. And if you are going to drink, like stifle that craving to eat at two in the morning. What else, Tony? I would say those are are some good starting points. Define your goals. See what you really want. If you're trying to lose those last few pounds, and you do drink frequently, if that's part of your lifestyle, you don't have to cut it out to make that progress, but it might pay to be smarter where you have, have the first drink or two on an empty stomach. So you don't have to have that third, fourth, fifth, sixth drink to kind of save it. When you're eating, try and go a little higher protein, lower fat for those days. And over time, that kind of stuff adds up, but it just like anything, it doesn't happen on a week to week scale. So if you do this for a week, you're not gonna notice a difference. If you do it for two or three months, you'll start to really notice a difference. I think it's a great place to, to start. And then, of course, we didn't even talk about this, the type of alcohol. We, we mentioned it a few times, right? Yes, we did. A straight liquor with a zero calorie addition, right? Yep. Vodka, soda, yep. whiskey, diet, Coke, things or like that. Or here on Team Tequila Talks, tequila soda. Tequila soda. Tequila soda. soda. Tequila soda. Never, well, I've never cheers. been a tequila soda fan, but well, you've you know, never been a tequila soda fan. You need to fan. listen to more of our episodes, and we will help yes. guide you in the right direction. Because my tequila soda with my fancy aromatics over here was absolutely excellent. I have two. That might be what I need to try. Yeah, I can help you. Uh, Check out Bloom Train, Tony Bloom. He's got an amazing educational Instagram. And as always, do all the click, like, subscribe things to Team Tequila Talks. Thanks for joining us, guys. Cheers. Cheers.